Hello all, my name is Tyler. And I'm John. And together we are DeLon Rigging Solutions, or DRS for short. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some rigging hardware. This is hardware that's commonly used in arena rigging or chain hoist rigging, whether it's in an arena or a uh, proscenium theater. This hardware, um, there are a lot of different manufacturers, a lot of different uh, exact products, but they're all pretty similar and they all uh, are tagged and labeled for a working load limit and some catalog information from the manufacturer. Sometimes you have to do a little digging to figure out what that catalog number is affiliated with, but they have some way of identifying what that piece of equipment is in addition to the working load limit. Uh, let's look at cable first. Um, this cable is a fairly new cable. It's half inch wire. It's a five foot cable. Uh, it's, this is, uh, it didn't quite get red paint, but typically we use red for a five footer. Uh, it's not a universal color code, but a common color code is red, white, and blue being five, 10, and 20 foot links. So red is five, white is 10, blue is 20. Uh, 30 footers and 50 footers are usually either yellow or green but there's not a lot of consistency about which is which. From company to company, just depending on what they choose. Um, so this is half inch, seven by 19 galvanized aircraft cable. It has an eye that's manufactured in it with a, a carbon steel swedge and a Flemish eye mechanical splice inside the swedge. This piece here, this compression fitting is called a swedge. This tag has a, has a uh, should have a serial number and has a working load limit on it, as well as a manufacturer name. These are uh, another five and a, and a ten that has white paint on it. This is a piece of 3 8 inch galvanized aircraft cable. Also 7 by 19 galvanized aircraft cable with a carbon steel swedge and a mechanical splice inside the swedge and a heavy duty thimble. The thimble is this part here that forces the eye to stay in an open shape. It also helps us to know if, if a piece of wire has been overloaded, probably that eye will deform a little bit. You may notice that this five footer does not have a tag on it. These were manufactured prior to the ANSI code, which required having tags on them. Since they live here in a single venue, that's not an issue for me personally. And uh, is um, as they are known, a known source that has been in my care and control. Uh, if I were touring with these, that could be a problem because some venues, some some jurisdictions are more strict than others about uh, cables being tagged. The ANSI code would require a tag on each piece of cable. Let's see, some other hardware. We have uh, the most commonly used shackles uh, in this industry are, are called screw pin anchor shackles. So these are an anchor shackle has to do with the shape of it, the shape of the bell, and this upper part is called the bell of the shackle. This is the bell of the shackle. This is the pin of the shackle. The screw pin, obviously, where that name comes from. So as a whole, this is called a screw pin anchor shackle. It also has a, a working load limit on it and some catalog information from the manufacturer. This is a 5 8 shackle. It's almost 100% used on one ton hoists and cable makeups for one ton hoists. You can, per the working load limit, use a half inch shackle, but half inch shackles could only be used 
where the, the load is pull to pull. So one cable attached to another cable. A 5.8 shackle, because it's overrated for a one ton hoist, it's a three and a, half, three and a quarter ton working load limit, which allows us enough reserve capacity that we can use it, for, the, for instance, for the bottom of a bridle, where it has two loads on the bell and the chain load on the pin. So most, most rigging companies on a one ton rigging rig or rigging kit would only include 5.8 shackles because it just saves confusion. You know you've got the right shackle in the right place. Similarly, with two ton hoists and half inch wire, some companies choose to use only three quarter shackles because that eliminates the chances of getting the wrong kind of a shackle in the wrong place. It is possible and within the load capacity to use a 5-8 shackle with half-inch wire. The problem is <clears throat> that with half-inch wire, there's not enough space in the bell to have more than one thing on the bell because they, they wedge against each other, which creates forces that are not acceptable. So if you use a 5-8 shackle with a two-ton hoist and half-inch wire, you can only use it where it's pull to pull where it's only one item connected to another item. Because there are some decisions to be made there and some, some choices that have to be made correctly, some companies choose to only use three quarter inch shackles in a two ton rig kit. <clears throat> you can see physically, there's quite a bit of difference between them. It's easy to tell the difference. Um, the size, the five eight shackle, is more a definition or more determined by the diameter of the stock here up, up in the bell. The pin is larger than that. Same way thing with the three-quarter shackle. The three-quarter has to do with the diameter of the bell, not necessarily with the diameter of the pin. Some other hardware that we use sometimes would be an oval ring and a pear ring. Pair ring. This one is. This one has been. This one was for a specific purpose. Uh, I just got it out to show the shape. It's a little smaller than I would typically choose to use in a in a chain hoist rigging situation. Uh, by the capacity, yeah, it'd be fine. But the physical size of it is a little bit small, and the logistics of putting more than one thing into the into the pair ring. I, I prefer a five eighths pair as being a more comfortable size. This is a half inch pair. Again, has to do with the diameter of the stock that it's made from. <clears throat> this oval is a smaller stock, but it's a bigger shape and has a working load limit that's adequate to one ton hoists and has plenty of space to physically, logistically include things in it. This is what's commonly called a deck chain. Uh, deck chains come in various lengths. I think this one is 10 lengths, which is uh, about two and a half, three feet long. And uh, we use a deck chain to be able to adjust the length of a bridle and to get an increment, an incremental adjustment that's smaller than our five foot and 10 foot cables. Uh, there was a time when shorter wire rope cables were used. Uh, I have a couple here <clears throat> of a, a one foot cable and a two and a half foot cable. And uh, they're good cables and good lengths and good, and good ways to get uh, a more precise bridle length. But you still don't have as small an increment as you have to change a bridle length by, by one link of a chain. Uh, most of the time, we don't have to be quite that critical, but sometimes it's necessary to be able to adjust that close. You'll see this, this deck chain has a tag in it, uh, giving a, telling us who the manufacturer is and what the, the road rating is. Uh, it's hard to keep tags on these sometimes. As you can tell, the ring's a little bit tore up. Um, they, they take a beating and the tags get lost. And then from a code point of view, 
they're no longer in code. Um, deck chain capacity is great enough to use it on a one ton or a two ton point, which you can verify with a tag. But uh, in general practice, they're used on one ton or two ton points in the leg of a bridle to adjust the length of the bridle. <clears throat> All right, another uh, piece of hardware is a, is a uh, a span set is a brand name. It's a, a polyester sling. A polyester sling is basically one long continuous piece of yarn <coughs> that's looped, wrapped. So we have just one piece of yarn. It's just we have multiple loops on it. There's a specific number of, of uh, loops in order to reach the appropriate strength. And then it has a protective sheath put over it. There's not really any good way to inspect the interior of this and, and the yarns themselves. So uh, the standard practice is that if the, if the protective covering is damaged, you have to assume that the interior structural part is damaged and it's out of here. Um, the downside of polyester slings is that they are susceptible to heat and can be damaged by heat from pyro or an incandescent light fixture right at it or um, uh, various sources of heat that could could damage it um, typically they're most often used to wrap an aluminum truss and attach the chain hoist to a truss i won't say that i've never used them in the air to make a connection but that's not the most typical use of them. The most common usage and best usage of them is to wrap a truss member to attach the hoist to it. A similar product, <clears throat> which is less susceptible to heat damage, is what's commonly called GACFLEX. GACFLEX being GAC, being galvanized aircraft cable, and FLEX being it's a way of using galvanized aircraft cable that's very flexible. This is basically the same principle as a polyester sling. It's multiple loops of a small diameter aircraft cable until you have enough loops to develop the strength of, of the, the, the piece is designed for. But it's very flexible because it's made up of all those very small loops or loops of a very small diameter cable. Um, so it is very flexible. You can use it just like a polyester sling, but it is less susceptible to damage by heat. Some manufacturers put an inspection port in them. This particular one does not. So that then you can, you can slide it over the whole thing and inspect the interior. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I would say that that inspection process is slow, painstaking, and difficult to say that it's 100% effective. So for the most part, uh, I go by the same rules I would on a polyester sling. If the protective covering is damaged, I'm going to assume that the interior has some damage somewhere and discard it. Uh, there are different grades of slings, polyester slings, and uh, uh, GACLEX slings, just as there are different sizes of aircraft cable. Um, these can be done depending on the number of loops of the structural material that are in there. It can be a different weight capacity. They used to be uh, kind of color coded so that you could tell by the color of the sling what the weight capacity was. But since they have become more widely used in the, in, in the entertainment industry, and we like things black and hidden in the dark, you have to go by the label. Because there are many, many, many different weight capacities, not many, many, but more than one weight capacity uh, manufactured with a black protective covering. So you have to rely on that tag to know what weight capacity sling you're working with. All right, the only other item that's a 
I'm going to consider it to be rigging hardware that's commonly used in the process of hanging hoist points is the burlap. There you'll find various opinions about the use of burlap. Uh, it's been used for many, many years to fold up and lay on a beam and then run your cable over the beam or over the burlap. So if you have your, your sling over the top of a beam and your load on the bottom of it, then the burlap breaks the corners on the beam and pads the corners. This helps uh, elongate the, the lifespan of your cable and offsets the loss of strength in the wire rope when you bend the corner with it because the sharper you bend the cable when you bend the cable you're compressing the wires on the interior stretching the wires on the exterior and that affects the strength of the wire the sharper you bend the corner the more you affect the strength while burlap under a load I mean, I, I can't put enough load on it, but if you hang 2,000 pounds on a one-ton hoist over sharp corners on a beam, it will bend those corners. And burlap doesn't have as much effect as we may like to think sometimes in padding that corner, but it does help increase the radius of that corner. And anything that increases the radius of the corner uh, is, is a good thing as far as the strength of the wire and damage to the wire. <clears throat> One thing I would say about damage to the wire. <clears throat> uh, in the construction industry, they use a standard of a certain number of wires can be broke before, before the cable has to be uh, discarded and, and put out of service. In the entertainment industry, we pretty much go on the standard of any broken wire. Not necessarily because of the strength, but because we handle them so much by hand. And broken wires tend to cause bleeding. So if you have a piece of wire that has, a, has broken, broken wires in it, it's probably going to get discarded just because it causes injuries. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll see that there's a little bit of a print in this cable. See where that permanent bend is? That's not enough that we would retire this cable, but if that bend became more acute or there were multiple bends in this, as it becomes permanently deformed, it gets closer and closer to its day of retirement. But while the wire rope user's manual will give you some specifications for how many wires can be broken before it needs to be retired, in the entertainment industry, uh, we really don't use that rule of thumb. If, if, a, if a cable is damaged then, and has a broken wire that, that's gonna hurt us, then we don't use it. Another thing that happens is that in the eyes, in the formation of the eyes, in the formation of the mechanical splice, sometimes there are a little spacing between the strands in the eye. Those, while you know, we'd rather not see them, are not structurally a huge issue. Uh, they're just a function of the fact that that wire has been mechanically spliced. So while of note and interest to look and see how clean they are, it's not something that we discard a wire over. Part of that's because they're in the eye. So in the eye, there are two load paths. Here you got two pieces of wire holding one piece of wire here. So you've already got twice as much strength with a load in the eye as you do in the straight part of the wire. All right, well that's, uh, that's a whirlwind look through some hardware. I'm sure you might have some other questions, but uh, that, that's the overview. And uh, we're gonna move over and move on to uh, how we put these hardware pieces together to use them for chain hoist rigging. Please remember that DeLong Rigging Solutions one-shot train videos are meant as general overviews. Every system is different. Every venue has different procedures. All statements made make certain assumptions about systems and venue similarities. Nothing can replace on-site training with a qualified individual. If ever you have a question or concern about rigging, 
Do not hesitate to reach out to us or another qualified vendor in your area.